Well, we're going to continue today with um, our uh, series on who is Jesus. And today we're going to be particularly looking at this idea of peace, that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So if you'd like to um, stand with me, we're going to uh, read this passage of scripture in John chapter 14. And this, uh, we're going to start with verse 23. We'll go through verse 27, and then we'll read one verse from Luke chapter 2. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while abiding with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. And the angel said, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Let's pray. Gracious Father, there are very few things in our lives that are more precious to us than peace. And Jesus is the Prince of Peace. I pray today that you would send forth your spirit of peace and help us to understand what it means when Jesus said, my peace I give to you. And Lord, I pray most of all that we would walk from this place into the coming week with peace in our heart. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. You may be seated. So, uh, a few years ago, Linda and I had the opportunity uh, when we lived out when we lived out in Oregon. Uh, one of the things about uh, living where we did is that it was uh, cheaper to fly to Hawaii than it was almost any place else in. Uh, in the country, the continental U.S. So one one year for an anniversary, we went over there to Hawaii for our vacation, and uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the places, of course, that we visited while we were there was, was Pearl Harbor. And uh, we, you know, you go there expecting, you know, you're going to see the Arizona Memorial, which is a very moving experience. As, uh, as you stand there and you read down all the names and you're standing over the uh, sunken hull of the ship and it's, a, it's an extremely uh, sobering experience. Next to the uh, Arizona Memorial is this ship, which is the USS Missouri. The USS Missouri is this ship was where they where Japan signed their unconditional surrender in Tokyo Harbor. Douglas MacArthur received that surrender. You go up on that ship, <clears throat> I knew I, I'd, been on, I'd been on some uh, uh, Navy ships before. They're, they're massive, in, incredible uh, feats of engineering and, and uh, this huge battleship and uh, but on this ship, on the deck, there was a round gold plaque. And it was, it was the plaque at the exact spot, they said, where the table was set, where that unconditional surrender was signed. Um, it caught me at that moment, uh, I was not prepared for the emotion that came standing and looking at that. 
I like I like history, so I've watched I don't know how many documentaries on World War II, uh, movies, read books, things like that. And as I stood there and I looked at that plaque, I thought of all of the pain and all of the suffering that had taken place, the millions of lives that had been lost. And it came to an end there. The hostilities ceased, at least politically and formally. And I and and uh, I'm not a I'm not a weeper and a crier, but I found tears in my eyes thinking of that moment when all of that was was done away with. And I find it interesting that this huge battleship with tremendous firepower becomes a symbol of peace because of that event that took place. In, uh, in May, I had the privilege of traveling to Israel with my son, Matt, and some students from uh, the Pacific Evangelical School of Ministry. This item that you see before you is also a symbol of peace. It's not a battleship. This is a, this is a manger. This is a manger that was found uh, in Bethlehem. Uh, it would have dated, it dates from the time around uh, in, in Christ's lifetime, around the date of what his birth would have been. You can see from the, it's, it's, the front part of it's been worn down quite a bit, but it's only, a, it's only about maybe three feet by three feet. It's concave, but but that's a, that, that would have been what a typical manger would have looked like. So I was sitting there thinking about this battleship that man created through which we try to subjugate our enemy, to bring them to a place of surrender and to a place of peace. And then you think about this, that the Prince of Peace was laid in something like this. And you begin to think that God does things differently than we do, doesn't he? And you think about one symbol of peace, a great battleship, and you think about this little lowly manger, nothing special about it. This would have been calm. And possibly, instead of being in a wooden stable, a lot of scholars believe that the mist manger probably, especially in the hills of Bethlehem there, would have been a cave <coughs> where Jesus was born. Not, not what you expect from a prince, right? Princes don't usually arrive and are laying in a in a feeding trough in a stable with uh, animals and smells. Uh, no princes are found in much better places. But when God chose to address the unrest and the chaos and the pain and the suffering and the death of the world. He didn't do it through might and power in the way that we think of might and power. But he sent the Prince of Peace into this world in a very humble, lowly way that nobody took notice of until angels appeared to another very lowly group of people. 
shepherds and said, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Peace is one of those things that is desired almost universally. In fact, people today that are activists that sometimes are using violence to achieve their purpose, the thing they're trying to achieve through their violence is some form of peace. We desire it. It's something that we long for. How many of you come home from a day at work and you just want to sit down and what? Have some peace. You come home, you say to your kids, could you guys just give me five minutes of peace? Please. You know, what's the old commercial? Cow gone, take me away. You know? I just, need, I just need something. But this, this idea of peace is something that universally people have a desire for. They have this, they will go to great lengths to find peace. We usually associate peace with things like the absence of strife or division or hostility or the absence of war. Uh, we may think of it as the absence of grandchildren who've been taken back home to be with mom and dad and sow peace in their home, right? We think of it as the absence of strife, chaos, those kind of things. And that was the very Greek idea of what peace was. But we also associate it with like a state of calm or tranquility or rest or silence. Oh, it's peaceful. Right? Jesus says to his disciples in John 14, I am going to leave peace with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives peace, I'm going to give you a different kind of peace than what the world envisions and what the world talks about. The question is, what is the peace that Jesus is talking about? Now, one of the interesting things about this statement that Jesus makes is he's making it in the upper room the night before his crucifixion. <clears throat> if you read the entire context, that, that upper room scene in the Gospel of John begins in chapter 13. It begins primarily with the foot washing experience. Jesus washing the disciples' feet, saying to them, as I've done this to you, you should do to each other. Then he goes on from there to the idea that one of them is going to betray them. And that conversation continues until it says that Judas got up and left and went out into the night. Peter speaks up then and says, well, listen, you know, I will never forsake you. Jesus predicts before the night is over, you're going to deny me. He moves straight after that. I can imagine just kind of you. That's right at the end of chapter 13. If you look at the first verse of chapter 14, which of course would not have been there, it moves right from Jesus saying to Peter, you will deny me to Jesus saying, let not your hearts be troubled. Don't let it be afraid for I go to prepare a place for you. They move right from that to this question. Where are you going? What do you mean you're going to prepare a place for us? Are we going to go with you? Jesus begins to make it clear. Where I'm going right now, you can't come. Now, if you had been with Jesus, 
and you were one of his disciples, and you were in that upper room, and you had put all, you had left everything in life to follow him, and this is the Messiah, what would have been going through your heart and mind that night as Jesus says, I'm going away? Would your heart have been at peace? Would your heart have been at rest? Evidently, theirs wasn't. Jesus says basically to them, while I'm going away, though, I'm going away, and it's actually better for you that I do go away, because if I go away, I will send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will be with you and beside you and in you wherever you go at all times. I will give you the Holy Spirit. And then he comes to this passage. My peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be afraid. So what's Jesus talking about? Is he talking about peace in the sense that uh, the Greeks talked about peace? Just the absence of strife, the absence of chaos, the absence of division, the absence of war. You see, Jesus is actually coming. Jesus wasn't uh, a Greek. Jesus was a Hebrew. And the Hebrew concept of peace is much broader than the absence of strife or contention or things of that nature. The Hebrew concept of peace is of wholeness and well-being. How many of you have ever watched shows? You watch shows where there's Jewish people, and what? How do they greet one another? What's their? What do they say? Anybody tell me? Shalom. Shalom. What do they say when they leave? Shalom. Shalom is the Hebrew word for peace. It meant more than if I, if I, if. Kent's leaving today, and as he's leaving the church, I say, Kent, shalom, Kent. I'm saying to him, I hope when you go home that you and, and Susie don't have any fights. I hope there's peace. I hope you have peace this week wherever you go, Kent, that there's no strife, there's no division. Of course I would want that for him, but it's much broader than that. It's actually a blessing. I hope this week you experience the well-being and wholeness that comes from God. That's what they're asking, what they're saying. Jesus is asking, Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm leaving you my peace, which is much broader, it's much deeper than simply the absence of chaos and strife. In fact, if you think about it, their lives after his death and resurrection were anything but free of chaos and strife and outside influences. They suffered. They went under persecution. They had people hunting them down. And yet, did you notice in the scripture, every time after the resurrection, Jesus would appear into the room where they were? What was his first words to them always? Peace be to you. Something deeper. A wholeness, a well-being. It's a, it's, this wholeness and well-being meant living according to God's original plan for humanity. It's a wishing that I, I, I hope, I, I'm asking God when I say shalom to you, when I wish peace to you, I'm saying I hope your life, in your life, you're experiencing all that God has planned and created you. I hope you know God's plan, God's wholeness in your life. That wholeness is marked by bearing his image. That he recreates us into people who are holy and righteous and loving. 
that we bear his image. That's how he made us. Let us make man in our image and for you and I to be whole, for you and I to know the peace that comes only from God is to be recreated through Christ and his image. It's a life marked by right relationship with God and people. God created us to live in peace and harmony with him always. And he created me to be at one and live in peace and harmony with people. Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17. Father, I pray that they all might be one as we are one. That's peace that Christ is talking about. And if God has recreated me in holiness, if God has recreated me in righteousness and in love, I have the foundation within me to live in peace with all people. Now, Paul the Apostle knew that we'd still live in a fallen world. And Paul knew that there are some people that will not live at peace with you. But Paul said this, as much as it lies within you, live peaceably among all people. As much as it lies within you, try to bring well-being to all people. Try to bring good into their life. Blessed, Jesus said, are the peacemakers. Not just the ones who run around and solve strife and the ones who bring warring factions together. But the peacemaker, the one who can bring well-being, the one who can bring wholeness through Christ into somebody's life. It's a life marked by the presence of the Holy Spirit. We were created by God for God to dwell within us through his spirit. For God breathed into us the breath of life, the spirit of life, and we became living souls. And until we are reanimated by the Holy Spirit in our lives, we are not whole. We are not what God intended us to be. So when Jesus talks about peace, He's talking about wholeness. The peace which Jesus gives is wholeness, which comes from being recreated in God's image through the baptism of his Holy Spirit, resulting in right relationships with God and people. So when Jesus says, my peace I give to you, Jesus says, Jesus is saying, I'm going to give peace to Ed. And what I want, I want to recreate Ed in my image. I want Ed to have the Holy Spirit abiding in him. And through the holiness and righteousness and love that comes to Ed through my abiding spirit, he can live in right relationship with me and he can live in right relationship with other people. And when you say to somebody, peace be to you, that's what we're talking about. That's the peace we're asking for. Oh, would we like our lives to be free of chaos? We sure would. Would we like for our life not to have anything unpleasant happen at all? Oh, we sure would. But that's what the world strives. The world strives for peace that depends upon the, the, the surrounding circumstances all being in my favor, right? That's peace. And Jesus is saying, even when the surrounding circumstances aren't in your favor, even when you don't feel that state of calm, even when you don't feel that absence of strife, you can still have peace because my peace comes from the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit who creates you to be like me and empowers you. 
to live at peace with me and other people. That's the peace Jesus is talking about. So why is he called the Prince of Peace? He's called the Prince of Peace because he purchased peace. Paul says in Colossians, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all of the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. We're going to celebrate communion here in just a few minutes. The blood was the purchase price of peace. Through Christ, he purchased for us on the cross redemption from all sin and the sin that separates us from God and the sin that brings distress and chaos into our lives. And Jesus Christ has paid the price to cleanse us from all sin. So when we take the cup, especially the cup that symbolizes his blood, that's the purchase price for peace that's been paid. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace because he gives peace. We read, he says, I will ask the Father, he'll give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I said. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give. John the Baptist said, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Peace begins with the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. And that baptism of the Holy Spirit comes through total surrender to Christ and faith that Jesus Christ is the one who gives the Spirit. And when the Spirit comes, the Spirit brings peace. The Spirit brings wholeness. <coughs> this uh, is a picture here of a place of peace. This is a uh, this is inside, it's a little hard for you to see, but it's inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. This is uh, the traditional place of the cross. Down here is a floor of uh, it's glass. Underneath the glass is the rock upon which traditionally they believe that Jesus was crucified. That's, that's where our peace was purchased. Of course, they're not certain that's the exact spot. Traditionally, that's where they said it was. But wherever it was there in the city of Jerusalem, we know that there was a point in the history of humanity when another human being who was fully God shed his blood on the cross to purchase peace for us. And that's what we celebrate now when we go to communion. We celebrate the fact that you and I can be people of peace because the Prince of Peace purchased peace and he gives peace and it comes through the presence of his Holy Spirit in our lives. <coughs> Let's pray. <coughs> Our Father, we come to you thankful that in Jesus we can have peace. Thankful that we can be recreated in your image, that our hearts can be holy and righteous and loving, and that through the power of the, and presence of your Spirit, we can live in right relationship with you 
and we can live in right relationship with other people. May we all know your peace. In Jesus' name, amen.